so I think we'll go ahead um, and get started. So thank you everyone for taking time out of your afternoon to join us. Um, we're really excited. This is kind of the first um, webinar that we have really gotten the opportunity um, to put on through SDSU Extension. And so um, we're really excited. And again, we thank you for being here. We're actually gonna start out today with um, our new range field specialist out of Lemon. Um, Jessalyn will talk about um, some of the range considerations and then I will follow up after her with more of the sheep management. So Jessalyn, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you, Jalen. Yeah, so today we're just gonna talk about some drought considerations for grazing range flocks. Uh, like Jalen said, I'm the new range field specialist out of the Lemon Regional Office. Um, so just a little bit further north than Jalen down in Rapid. And I'm gonna talk a little bit on the range and pasture management side for our flocks. And then Jalen's gonna get more into the production. So just a little bit of background on the drought and kind of where we're at with it. Um, this is the US Drought Monitor for South Dakota. It was actually just updated last week. Um, on the 29th. And there was some improvement, especially in this little region down in way southwestern South Dakota. Um, they moved out of the abnormal or the moderate drought into just abnormally dry. So that's some good progression. Um, but all in all, in, in our far northwest region, still extremely dry, really drought up here, um, dealing with a lot of erosion and kind of, kind of all sorts of different things. One, one producer I was talking to said, this is probably the worst drought he's seen up in our area in, in about 20 years. So it's, it's starting to look pretty tough out there. So moving on to our precipitation regime. So I just pulled um, two different locations in South Dakota, Redfield, a little bit East River and Faith West River over here. So you can see that we receive most of our most of our rain throughout May, June, and the July months. Um, however, that early rain in March, April, May is really important to our cool season grasses to get a start on them. Um, so just to put some numbers to this, in, in the faith area on average, we should have about 3.3 and three quarters of an inch um, at the date we're at right now. And we actually only have about a half inch. So we're at about 14% of our average rainfall. And then over in Redfield, they're a little bit better. They get about four inches a year and they're at about 3.3 inches. So they're at, they're at about 86% of their normal precipitation for the year. Um, so obviously when we're at 14% of our normal precipitation over in the western, northwestern half of South Dakota, we're seeing a lot of um, delayed forage production just because we haven't received that adequate rainfall yet. So here, um, this map comes from the South Dakota NRCS looking at some forage production estimates. And this was as of April 15th. So not quite up to date and actually we really received some decent rain um, south of Buffalo over here kind of over the weekend. So this might change a little bit once they get the new one out. But as you can see, anything in green, they're at about normal forage production. So normal precipitation, getting normal forage production. And as we move closer to that red, orangish red, we're getting a lot more in the drought areas um, with that only about 70% of our normal forage production. So that right there is kind of telling you that we're gonna see at least a 30% reduction in forage um, in some areas and right there that's gonna shorten our grazing season so likely we're gonna have to delay our turnout until our plants are ready to be grazed. Um, I was out in the field yesterday just kind of looking at <clears throat> the, the new growth and where we were kind of at and I, I think we're probably about two weeks behind normal where we should be in this area right now and I'll touch on that a little bit later at looking at some of those indicators when we're ready to turn out. Um, but our native range, that those cool season grasses are just not quite ready to be grazed yet. And another thing with our shortened grazing season, we know we're probably going to have to start feeding earlier in the fall. Um, so with that, probably lowering our stocking rates is going to be very, very realistic, whether it's a polar show calling of the flock or early weaning. And Jalen will touch on both of these a little later in the presentation. But 
going to be options that we're going to have to look at, sadly. One thing to help a little bit with this drought, make sure that we're rotating our pastures often to prevent any great any overgrazing. Um, basically, if we are overgrazing, we're going to allow a lot of our unwanted plants to come in. And generally, we're overgrazing our drought tolerant native plants, and then those are probably going to get killed off first. So right along with forage production, we're going to see a lot of differences in quality during a drought. So a lot of people think um, generally our production or our quality is going to be lower, which is true, but drought, drought stress might actually delay plant maturity. So this is basically saying if those plants are stressed, they're not going to put energy into going to seed right away. They're going to stay in that vegetative state a little bit longer. So our cool season plants, um, our western wheat, even our some of our tame, tame grasses, crested wheatgrass, might not go to that seed head as early as we think they should, just because they're so stressed, they're gonna stay, keep their energy in their roots and in their vegetative state. However, overall, we are gonna see a quick decline in forage quality if we don't get some rain. Um, likely, yes, that, that extension of not going to seed might delay in some of those cool seasons, but overall we are gonna see an earlier dormancy. So instead of that, um, you know, later July or August period, we might definitely be getting into that dormant state earlier. And this is where supplementation likely is gonna be required a lot sooner than normal just to meet those new requirements. So if we look at this little, um, charts here on the right side, it's looking at total digestible nutrients, so our TDN, mainly our energy. Use, um, depending if they have a single or trips or even quads, I guess, kind of fit into that medium to high nutrient requirement. So you can see that our warm season grasses likely aren't even going to be hitting that those high nutrient requirement use um, as far as energy. And then our cool season perennial grasses, um, could be touching there, and our cool season annual grasses, our smooth grown western wheat, or excuse me, crested wheat, and Kentucky bluegrass likely are going to stay higher in that quality for longer, um, and we should be okay with those, but we really need to be paying attention at what time we're lambing to go into, um, I guess, when these plants start hitting dormancy and quality is dropping, so we can start supplementing. And with that, uh, we might have some ewes that do really well or okay within these dry drought years, and we might have some that do pretty poor. So that might be one way to look at calling, but also to group those lower conditioned animals together um, and sorting them and just supplementing them if you don't think the whole block needs to be supplemented. So really um, doing some condition scoring, which Jalen will talk about later, and then overall sorting. So this is just a quick example I pulled of a pretty common cool season grass, um, Western wheat grass. So the variety is Rodan, which is the native variety we'll find throughout South Dakota. And just looking at crude protein and then our TDN, which is our energy requirement, generally with these lactating ewes, we're probably a little bit more concerned with them meeting that energy requirement. Um, and they're, depending if they have a single or a trip, they're going to be anywhere between that 65 to 72 percent on the energy requirements. So really right in the beginning leaf stage western wheat is when we might be hitting and meeting that requirement. But you can see how quick that that TDN percentage drops by the time we get to the boot and seed head. We're definitely not going to be hitting enough energy with that. Um, and western wheatgrass is probably a be better higher quality cool season than a lot of our natives. Um, so kind of a good, a good indicator grass. So this, these tables I pulled from the Grasses in Northern Plains publication through NRCS and NDSU. And they have these for all different types of grasses, actually. I just thought Western wheat was a good, a good example for us. Um, but if anyone's interested in, you know, looking at what species they have out in their pastures, then kind of comparing this back to these quality percentages, that's where you would find these charts. 
So beyond production and forage quality, we're definitely gonna see some other issues out on the range with drought. Um, likely we're gonna see an increase in toxic, toxic or poisonous plants. So our, our livestock are gonna be more likely to consume these during the drought just because um, if they're lacking palatable forage. And it's good to note that, you know, if there's a few, few of these poisonous plants that you identify out in your pasture, might not be a problem. It's when we get into huge amounts, um, large, a lot of production of them, that's what's gonna make them poisonous is if they, they the amount that they consume. So a lot of these are drought resistant, um, these poisonous plants, so they'll actually appear more so during a drought, definitely should be on the lookout for them. Some examples include black hembane, which this actually causes dilated pupils in ewes and then they convulse. Chokecherry, so a lot of people um, generally don't think about chokecherry as a common plant, but if we're lacking palatable or decent forage out in our pastures and we have a lot of chokecherry bushes, they might actually seek it out. So it's the most toxic in early spring when we have those early leaves and then throughout the season, it, it gets less and less toxic. Death camas, which is actually the plant on the left-hand side down here. Um, Halogeton, local weed, lupine, which is the purple flower pictured on the right, purple form. Milkweed, so mainly the narrow leaf species. Um, we do see a lot of the broad leaf species throughout South Dakota. And those ones, they generally have to consume a large, large quantity of. The narrow leaf species, um, smaller amounts will cause toxicities some milk fetches, and then some poison and water hemlock. Um, we definitely see both of these along wetter areas, our uh, riparian areas or creeks, um, so on. And then St. John's wort. St. John's wort is um, good to note because it actually causes photosensitivity in sheep. So if you've just recently shorn or you have white pigmented sheep, they can be especially susceptible to St. John's wort with that photosensitivity. And then any of these plants that have a star, um, generally small amounts of them will be toxic to sheep. So I pulled these photos from the USDA website. They have um, a pretty good documentation of all the toxic plants to each, each species of livestock and then pictures there too, if you're unsure. If you do have any, I guess kind of a breakout of a large, large forb type plant that you're not sure what it is and you're thinking it could be toxic, definitely bring it to, um, you know, some type of range specialist that can help you ID it just to make sure it isn't something that could be poisonous. So some other grazing issues more, um, looking at our invasive weed species, definitely gonna see these more prevalent during a drought just because most of them are drought resistant. We'll see a lot of kochia, pigweed, ragweed, cheatgrass, and then our noxious weeds, leafy spurge, hunks, tongue, thistles, um, really can withstand droughts well. So one option that multi-species producers might want to look into is possibly using sheep to control these weeds. We're all already gonna be short on forage um, for both sheep, and then if we have cattle too, and sheep will definitely be more likely to utilize these weeds or forbs or woodies before the cattle would. So it might be an option to kind of um, flash graze with your sheep and try to encourage them to control the weeds, use it as forage. We actually can see some pretty decent quality in some of these weeds early on. Um, so sheep, sheep might likely actually pick them out. One thing to be note, one thing to note and kind of um, be informed about is that some of these weeds can definitely be toxic if they're consumed in large quantities. So kochia, pig pigs, pigweed, and hound's tongue um, especially can be toxic. And then also be on the lookout, of course, for wool contamination. Um, going to be a concern with these weed species that are going to have burrs or awns and are easy to get caught in the wool. So another issue that we're already facing up in my region is water. Um, so we're seeing a lot of water shortages, either dams that just didn't refill or really low creeks that we depend on for water. So one thing to make sure when you're looking at doing some grazing planning 
just make sure that you're timing your grazing correctly with your water sources. So if you currently have a creek that is pretty full, you'd rely on it for water, but you think it might dry up by the end of the summer, be sure to utilize that pasture sooner than later. Um, I guess just some options that a lot of people are probably gonna have to look at this year to get water out to livestock is either to haul it, install pipeline um, above or below ground, honestly, and then look at water developments with holding tanks kind of especially important in times of drought if we have any wells dry up or anything at least we have that big holding tank there to rely on for a little while and then one one huge concern is just the quality of water definitely an, an extra issue that is seen during drought so we see increased sediment loads just from all the erosion and um, sediment blowing salt accumulations, and then our TDS, our solids or salts are going to be higher generally too. And then one more thing to be on the lookout for, blue-green algae is more so when it gets warm, um, hot and, and dry, like the conditions that we're going into. So South Dakota State does offer water testing. We can do the quick water tests right here at our extension centers. Um, if you go on our website, which this is a link to a great article, if you go on our website, extension.sdsstate.edu, um, you can get a full list of where you can bring water samples to. And if it is, if the quick test does show that it's high, um, we can send it off labs to get a, an official test done too. So. One thing that we really need to have a good handle on is kind of creating an overall drought plan for grazing when we're going into such dry conditions like this. So the first step is really just to take inventory of what you have. Look at your forage production um, and your stockpiled forages. So that probably is going to be any of your maybe winter stock for forages, um, anything that maybe you didn't graze or save last year and so on. So see where you're at, um, you know, are you noticing lower production and where you're at within that forage production map might tell you a little bit more too. Um, but definitely go and look at your plant communities. So if we look at this little triangle graph on the right side here, um, it just kind of shows us what species prefer what. And truthfully, this is probably flock or herd dependent um, just with what is available for them to eat or what they've kind of been trained to eat. So looking at the diet selection, we know that sheep are probably gonna prefer forbs for the most part and some grass and a little browse. Our cattle are gonna prefer grasses, forbs, and then some browse. Um, and then goats are gonna prefer more browse than forbs and grasses. So, to go out and kind of take inventory of your pasture, it's really important to note these plant communities. You have a very four browse dominated pastures, um, looking for big and silver sagebrush, buckbrush, fringe and cudweed sageworts or lead plant. Those would be great pastures to put your sheep out into right away. And oftentimes we see these four dominated pastures and pastures that have typically been grazed by cattle, um, basically, eating all of the grasses that are out there and leaving the forbs. So it might be an option to kind of switch up this year and go, go in some of those pastures with your sheep. And then our grass dominated pastures for natives would include our Western wheatgrass, our green needle grass, our cool seasons, and then our warm seasons, prairie june grass, blue and side oats grandma, buffalo grass, and a little big blue stem. So these are kind of some key species to be on the lookout for to get an idea of what your plant communities look like. We also have a lot of pastures that are invaded by our tame grasses, Kentucky bluegrass, crested wheat grass, and smooth brome. Um, and those pastures honestly are best to utilize first when we're looking when we're looking at where to go right away in the beginning of spring. Um, so again, for multi-species operation, just make to road make sure to rotate your cattle and sheep differently each year. We know that each species kind of prefers different types of forb or grass. Um, so switching it up might actually give your pastures a, a better rest period than not. And I know again, fencing is gonna be a huge limitation, but this is definitely one of those years that we are gonna need to utilize all the production we possibly can. 
So more on creating a drought plan. To make an actual grazing plan, we really should look at our grazing readiness and timing. I touched on this a little earlier. Um, to actually see when your pastures are ready, you really should be going out and looking at some of your forages. Some of the easy, easiest plants to tell, um, I guess, when they're ready is western wheatgrass for our natives, the cool seasons, and then probably crested wheat or smooth foam for our invasives. So you want to make sure most of them are all at that three and a half leaf stage, like you can see on the right here. Um, basically, that means they're ready to utilize. You're not going to harm them from grazing them. So I said before that we want to utilize those tame pastures first. Oftentimes, if we have an intermingled native and tame grass community out in our pastures, we actually want to set back those, those invasive species and allow our natives to break through. So our Kentucky bluegrass, our smooth brome, our crested wheatgrass, I wouldn't be too afraid to go in there a little bit earlier than supposedly when they're ready. Um, definitely would be, would be important to allow your native grasses um, growth time first and then utilize those, those tame grass pastures in place. And this should allow your, your native plants to resubmerge, hopefully, if you're setting those back a little bit. So that early spring grazing, if we're looking for somewhere to go right now, I would definitely utilize any, any of those pastures that have real infestations of those tame grasses. Um, so again, I said I was out, out yesterday actually looking at the range. In our area, we're actually only about at the two and a half to three leaf stage. And a lot of times we would be about at that three and a half leaf stage, the four leaf stage right now um, with our cool seasons. So we're definitely probably about two weeks behind further north up here. As we head further south into South Dakota, I would say we're probably starting to hit that three and a half leaf stage for sure. So again, graze those stockpiled pastures. Um, SDSU has done some research showing that you could flash graze your winter pastures, just take about 25%, and there actually would be no decrease in forage production for next winter. Um, again, flash graze being a key term there. Uh, use your rotational grazing, like we talked about, especially with your multi-species grazing. Um, but even if you are just strictly a sheep producer, definitely don't go into the same pasture that you went into at the beginning of the year last year. Um, you might be hurting those cool season, season natives that are trying to grow. So kind of giving them a break until later in the season and going into a different pasture first to allow them that break. And of course, allow you avoid using any pastures that are in low condition. Um, so a lot of times we're probably gonna to wanna to defer these pastures to fall, some of our pastures that have been grazed harder last fall, um, we probably are not gonna to wanna to go into right now just because they're gonna probably be in pretty tough, low, low condition. So give them enough rest to get that regrowth um, and actually to get some decent forage production and have good quality forage out there too. All right, so just kind of to wrap up here, um, really avoid overgrazing your way through a drought. You're only going to be kicking yourself for next year's grazing season. If we don't come out of this, um, I'm honestly scared to see what next year will look like. But honestly, be ready to set yourself up for next year. So overgrazing can also lead to lower productivity, lighter lambs, and we might even see some increased health problems with that. Truthfully, you should really be thinking about moving to a dry lot or looking for alternative feeds before we're overgrazing. So of course, keep the soil covered for erosion control. Throughout Western um, North South Dakota, we've had kind of very, very high winds this spring out of the norm. Definitely are seeing a lot of soil blown in areas that it generally would not. So very important when it's dry to keep that soil covered. And we need that pasture recovery after the drought. Um, again, we just want to prep ourselves to be going in decent condition for next year's grazing system. So overall, I guess it, it definitely would be a good option to create a whole ranch plan to be proactive for planning and drought. All right, and with that, I will turn it over to Jalen.
Perfect. Thank you, Jessalyn. Okay, so kind of to take off where Jessalyn just left off and um, kind of that importance of being proactive in prior planning. Um, it's really important that we're meeting our requirements from a nutrient level or <clears throat> nutritional level on our flock. Um, we know that the first thing to go when we slack on nutrition is our per <clears throat> production levels. Um, and so depending on where you're at in the production cycle can be really important as we go into um, this drought season. When we look at actual requirements um, here, you'll see just our energy requirements for 154 pound U um, kind of throughout that um, production cycle. And for many people, if you're spring lambing, um, you'll hit kind of those low forage production periods as we enter maintenance um, and maybe potentially going into breeding season. Um, and so like Jessalyn alluded to, many of our forages will meet those requirements at that stage, um, but you still have to keep in mind potential supplementation. Um, and of course, your, your normal practices like flushing and breeding. Um, but you, if you're one of those producers that fall lambs, that's when we're really gonna see um, an increase in the nutrient requirement demand of those ewes going into some of these low forage quality periods. Um, as we approach even early in to late gestation in late summer, um, a lot of people are throwing bucks in now for fall lambing. And so just keep in mind that um, you're gonna probably have to supplement those, those ewes going into their <clears throat> um, early gestation and late lactation, especially on a year with a drought. Luckily, you know, we talked a little bit about culling and things like that. Um, good thing our markets are looking really good right now. Uh, our lamb market, according to the Livestock Marketing and Information Center, should stay pretty consistent. Um, you can see the chart here on the right shows the three market average for 60 to 90 pounders. Um, and it, it, things look good. Of course, we know that sometimes predicting prices can be a little bit like predicting the weather. Um, and as people start to cull harder or early wean or don't hold back as many ewe lambs and start to flood the market, we could definitely see a drop in our prices. Um, but these prices are still um, something to be looking forward to for sure. Um, additionally, you know, maybe it's beneficial to look into um, some contracts or selling into a feedlot. Um, the last prediction I looked at based on the Colorado feedlots, they're trending about 20,000 head below last year's average. Um, and just talking to some people in, in the um, Superior Farms plant, they're having a really hard time finding some of those lighter lambs. Um, now we're kind of coming out of those ethnic markets um, as we approach summertime, but um, still feedlot, putting those lambs into a feedlot might be an option as well. Um, when we look at culling ewes, our cull ewe prices are actually not too bad either. Um, based on St. Ange and Sioux Falls, kind of our South Dakota average on cull ewes right now is about 91 cents. Um, so maybe culling a little bit harder um, will end up benefiting you in the long run anyways. Um, in terms of supplemental feeds, um, we know that going into a drought season, regardless if you're buying hay or some of your concentrate feeds, um, our prices are, are just going to keep climbing. Um, and if you've tried to buy feed anytime recently um, with corn prices or anything like that, um, I talked to a producer that paid, uh, I think, $5.75 for corn a week ago. So, you know, buy those things early if possible. Uh, if you can get your hands on it, getting your hands on hay right now is kind of a challenge, but um, we'll talk about some options to maybe stockpile some as well. And some of that comes with the option of early weaning. So really our peak lactation on our ewes is about three to four weeks after they've lambed. And so we can wean as early as 60 days or if those lambs are about 40 to 45 to 50 pounds um, without there being too many complications. Um, 
the benefit, I guess, to early weaning is that really your efficiency of just feeding those lambs rather than feeding the ewe, the ewe producing milk, and then that milk providing nutrients to your lambs um, is that you have a much better feed efficiency conversion. And then on top of that, um, if you look at your dry matter intake on the right side of the screen for, again, 154 pound twin bearing ewe, you have almost a two pound per day increase in dry matter intake when you go from, um, or when you look at late lactation compared to maintenance. And so um, you can reduce the amount that you have to actually feed that ewe and that she needs to consume by almost two pounds. And so from an economic standpoint, um, if we were to throw this into a scenario, let's say um, we have 100 head of ewes that we're gonna early wean at 60 days. So again, we're feeding that 1.8 pound less of feed. So over the course of 30 days, that saves you almost three tons of hay. Um, so that's another three ton that you don't have to buy this fall. Um, with grass hay right now, um, 125 is conservative in some areas, um, but that's still a savings of about $3 per head per month. Now, when it comes to actually early weaning those lambs, um, there's lots of options. Uh, here's just two of them. One, let's say you wean those lambs at about 45 pounds, 45, 50 pounds. Um, there is a market for those. The ethnic market really likes those lighter weight lambs. And right now those are worth about three, $3 a pound. Um, I've seen as high as 310. And so here you can actually just wean those, those lambs and sell them and make about 140 bucks a lamb. The second option, um, which is usually recommended with an early wean, is to actually creep those lambs for another you know, month or so. Um, younger animals actually have a greater average daily gain and can be marketed at a younger age. And so um, we can actually market those lambs, let's say um, at 65 pounds, where they're worth about 275 right now and make almost 180 a lamb. Additionally, if those lambs are being sold into a feedlot or um, you know, your, your buyer at the sale barn is transitioning them into a feedlot, they are gonna transition better onto that finishing diet, um, which is gonna just help them in the long run um, in terms of acidosis and working them onto that finishing diet. Um, and if we have time at the end, I'll go through um, the partial budget of if you were to compare these two scenarios um, actually holding those lambs on creep a little bit longer is actually going to be a better, um, I guess, use of your money and you'll make more money feeding those lambs longer and having a higher weight lamb than just getting rid of them at 45 pounds. Another option, um, I'm not going to go too much into this because hopefully y'all will tune in with us on Thursday. Um, but just for some small cost savings, even if nothing else, um, selective deworming can help us without having to, to deworm everything. And so if you look at um, comparing kind of your cheaper, if you will, lower end ivermectins compared to like amoxidectin or something that's a little bit more expensive, uh, you could be saving anywhere from 42 to $1.17 a dose is about what I figured. And you can um, selectively deworm in a couple different ways. Um, you can run some fecal egg counts and actually um, collect feces and estimate the, the worm burden. Uh, you can also do an on-farm FAMACHA scoring. And so that's the picture there on the right where you're actually looking at the degree of anemia um, in the mucosa of the eye. And so the wider that inner mucosa is, the more anemic that animal is. And so the chances of them having, especially your barber pole worm, um, is a lot higher. And those are the animals that, that you want to make sure to deworm. Additionally, another benefit to selective deworming is you're also going to aid in that dewormer resistance that um, we've, our industry talks a lot about being quite an issue. Moving into some culling considerations, one that's super easy to do at weaning um, or shearing or anytime you've got ewes in is just simply bagging your ewes. Um, and just 
feeling that bad for any hard lumps, um, chances are that you had mastitis at some point in her lambing season. Um, and so this is really important to do before your ewes have dried up. Um, sometimes you can detect lumps a lot easier when that bag is still kind of distended um, before they've completely dried up. Um, just looking at the milk yields can be really important too. In culling your lower producing ewes, um, chances are if they're not producing milk, they probably don't have a super great lamb on them either. Um, and then um, just a, a quick side note, looking at teat placement and the degree of separation between bags can help indicate um, some potential complications as well. Um, if those teats are placed, um, I guess you're ideally looking at this teat placement number five and any deviation from that, the lambs can actually have a harder time suckling. And then anytime there's a degree in separation in those sides, um, you have an increased chance of harboring some even subclinical mastitis. This also might be a good year to start fine tuning our genetics. And so that means culling sheep that just don't meet your criteria for whatever it is, um, whether that be the amount of lambs that they're weaning or even your micron. Um, this might be a good year to cull those bottom performers and really hone in on what it is that your, in, or your operations goals are. Um, this could also be some of your maternal traits. This might be a good year just to get rid of that you that never seems to raise lambs. Another option is starting to kind of moderate the frame size on our flocks. So it's really easy to walk into a ram pen and want that big, growthy looking buck. Um, but down the road, it also means that we're gonna um, have larger, growthier lambs and ewes that just require a little bit more feed and more in just maintenance. So if we look at, again, dry matter intake of ewes, um, here we're increasing our body weight by about 22 pounds. And with every one of those increases, we're increasing about a third of a pound of feed a day. <clears throat> um, and so a third of a pound doesn't sound like a lot, but on a stressed pasture, if we're looking at nine pounds over the course of a month for an individual animal, that adds, that adds up pretty quick. Um, and you could equate this to a lot of other things, you know, supplementation as we get into some of those more nutrient um, higher nutrient requirement periods and things like that. Um, larger framed animals tend to cost you a little bit more money. Moving into body condition scoring. Um, this is a great tool, not just for identifying some of our poor doers or some of those animals that are maybe um, nutritionally or health challenge, but also it helps us give us an idea if those animals are declining in terms of their body condition, chances are the forage out on our pastures isn't quite doing its job. Um, also, if you've got ewes that are just coming out of um, having lambs on them in a poor condition, throwing them on a low quality pasture probably isn't gonna help them much. Um, increasing body condition is way harder than, than taking it off. And so, um, these animals in a lower body condition aren't going to perform for you coming into breeding season um, and are just going to require a lot more work um, to get them where they need to be. Um, ideally, we like to see our sheep in around a body condition score three. Um, and if you're, if you're not familiar with body condition scoring, um, definitely reach out to us. But you're just feeling for fat composition kind of over that loin muscle behind the last rib um, and ahead of the hip bone. Um, and some of that can be done visually as long as those ewes aren't in wool. Um, it, it doesn't help us a whole lot if those ewes are in a heavy wool. We also need to think about some of our um, disease considerations going into drought. These hot, dusty conditions um, can lead, often lead to pneumonia and pink eye. Um, our worm burdens might be more of an issue in the fact that those animals are gonna be grazing a lot closer to the ground and a lot closer to where those eggs actually are. Um, we were in a meeting the other day with some sheep producers here, West River, and blue tongue got brought up um, because it is apparent in our West River deer populations. A lot of times you don't see these hemorrhagic type viruses until we really hit that D4 drought stage. Um, but it's something to be aware of for sure. Um, I know the Montana ram sale 
has a protocol in place if animals do come to the ram sale um, with blue tongue. Unfortunately, it can be a little hard to diagnose. Um, you will see kind of that discoloration, obviously, of the mouth and gums, and oftentimes just above the, the hoof. Um, since those blood vessels are hemorrhaging, you'll see some uh, swollenness in the face, but most of all, you're just gonna see that those animals are pretty lethargic. Um, the swelling coupled with that hemorrhaging is just gonna decrease their oxygen. I'm gonna make them just appear really lethargic. And so this is actually spread through flying midges. And during drought years, we see a lot more flies, a lot more mosquitoes um, and a lot more of these midges, especially in areas of standing water. Um, and of course, like Jessalyn said, we might see less standing water, but the warm conditions certainly harbor, um, or I guess promote the reproduction of these midges. Um, you can use insecticides, um, especially if you're, you're managing for sheep kids and lice and ticks. Um, Permethrin has sh been shown to help mitigate these midges to some extent, um, but some literature suggests that it's maybe not very long term. Um, if, you're, if you are really concerned, you can also get the insecticide tags as well. And so I guess um, just in conclusion, the big thing is making sure we're, we're doing our best to meet those nutrient requirements. Um, we really want those animals to produce for us, whether it's wool or lambs um, or both, obviously. Um, meeting those nutrient requirements is critical. Secondly, we need to capitalize on our opportunity costs um, where we can cut costs compared to where, you know, we might have to spend some money now to save some money later. But altogether, our prices are really looking good and they're forecasted to stay relatively good. So I guess that's, that's a big perk. Um, I heard a producer say the other day that they've heard of several people in South Dakota selling, at least selling down their cow herd to switch to sheep. Um, and on a drought year, that's probably not a bad idea since we know that our sheep are a little bit more tolerant, um, but we still have to keep them in mind. Um, your culling considerations really need to match what your production goals are. And so keep those in mind and maybe this is a good year to, to really hit home on some of those production goals that you've been striving for. And then finally, just monitor for disease um, and making sure that, that we're keeping those animals healthy. And so with that, we'll take any questions. Also, if you wouldn't mind, we just popped a survey up on the screen. If you wouldn't mind filling that out for us, we'd sure appreciate it. I have a question for uh, Jessalyn, if that's okay. Yeah. Jessalyn, so uh, uh, Travis Hoffman, uh, NDSU, my, uh, my quick question um, is, uh, again, kind of on the, the plant growth and saying and knowing that we're behind uh, in comparison our three leaf, three and a half leaf stage. And so I think some of the inquiries that, that I have uh, when individuals are going out to the pasture is, is you said that you can use different wheat grasses to evaluate that 
leaf stage, but are there grasses that are out there um, in the pastures that you can't look at or to make sure that I know what that indicator plant is? Can you have any direction on that of not just saying, okay, I'm gonna open the gate and look at the ground and see see what I can do to, to know if uh, now is the time that I should put those animals out. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Jalen, can you scroll back to that uh, where I have a picture of the three and three and a half leaf stage? Just so we can see what I was referencing. So this does come from NDSU. Um, so the main ones that we're looking at, generally we're just looking in the spring when we're going on to our cool season grasses um, that are actively growing. Our warm seasons are gonna definitely be later growing actively during warmer. Um, but the main ones that we wanna look at when we are going out there would be Western wheat grass as far as our natives. And then also some green needle grass, um, not as easy to identify when it's immature, I guess. Our Western wheat grass is pretty easy because it has that bluish um, green tint to it. And then it's got the 45 degree angle leaves. And then if we're looking at tame grasses, we would really wanna be looking at our crested wheatgrass and our smooth brome for that three and a half leaf stage. Um, but basically we're just looking at our cool season grasses because that's what we're gonna see greening up right away in the spring when we're going out onto our pastures. Whereas our warm season grasses will rotate into as we get later into the grazing season. Does that kind of clarify? Outstanding, thank you. Uh, my, my additional question uh, is to Jalen. And so this would be on a little bit of the weaning and weaning ranges that you've discussed of the 60 day and or 90 day. And I, I certainly appreciate that thought process. Uh, and right now, probably for several people, we're either at the 60 days or can make that decision soon. So do you have any particular guidance um, for some of those producers, uh, particularly in our feed stuff? So let's say, that next week um, that we are going to be weaning those um, rams, weathers, and ewe lambs, whatever we uh, so chose, um, uh, in terms of the feedstuffs and kind of how we get those transitioned. What's the quick thought process to our producers? Yeah, I think that's definitely something that's probably on everybody's mind. Um, hopefully, you know, we're, we're utilizing some sort of creep prior to early weaning, um, that's critical. Um, part of making sure that we're having an effective early wean is making sure that those, those lambs know where the creep is. Um, and in terms of um, specific feeds, um, I guess my recommendation is on a year like this, when um, we know that corn prices are high and trucking uh, prices are high, it's really finding what works in your area um, and working with um, your local um, nutritionist or um, uh, heck, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, your local like grain mill um, to see what what's available to for your creep. Um, it's really important that those that creep is um, relatively high in fat and energy um, and also um, has a certain level of protein as well. Um, I apologize, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but um, I guess, does that answer your question, Travis, or what? Uh, th thank you, Jay Lynn. It's a, at least keeping in consideration kind of where we can be on, on protein. And like you said, have an idea of what you want to do before we get there um, mm -hmm. and, so, and have some creep available. So I, I kindly appreciate that. That thoughts and thank you ladies. We also had a question. Um, Luke asked if the 1.8 decrease in early weaning dry matter intake includes the reduction from lamb consumption. Um, it does not. That's purely what that you requires um, at, la at late lactation and um, maintenance. So it doesn't include anything from lamb consumption as well. So there's additional um, I guess feed you'd be supplementing to your lambs um, is not included in that estimate. Okay. 
I guess since we have a few more minutes, um, I'll pull up, I guess the benefit to early weaning. Um, this is, this is um, are you seeing my screen, Jessalyn, with the partial budget on it? Yep, you can see okay. it. Um, so just some rough estimates here. Um, if we were, oh, this is the wrong one. Hold on a second. Um, so anytime you're making operational changes, um, one really neat tool to use is a partial budget. Um, this just takes the additional costs and reduced income from making that change um, and compares it to the additional income and reduced costs or your net good and your net bad of making that change. So here, um, if we were to early wean those lambs at 60 days and feed them on creep for another four weeks, as opposed to just keeping them on the use and weaning at 90 days, um, our additional costs are um, your U intake here is going to be at the maintenance level. Um, and I use these are all the same numbers that were in my presentation. So about six cents a pound for that hay. Um, a creep generally, um, based on some, some other estimates, um, is about 40 cents a pound. And then that additional hay that you're going to be supplementing with those lambs as well. Um, in this case, um, typically a lamb on creep is going to gain a lot better than um, your lamb that's just nibbling on creep and consuming off mama. So um, in this scenario, we're going to say that those lambs gained an extra five pounds for being early weaned. Um, and then our reduced cost here is going to be that you intake at late lactation. If you're supplementing those use with some corn and then um, the creep that those lambs will be consuming while on mom as well. Um, and so if we look at our net income or loss, actually holding those lambs on creep a little bit longer um, and early weaning them here has a relative profitability of about $1,500. Um, and so there's obviously a lot of other things that you could throw in this partial budget. Um, but here again, just saying these 100 head of use at a 122% lamb or weaning percentage, early weaning um, has a relative profitability of about $1,500. So just to put it more into financial opportunities. Marilyn, where can they find this um, partial budget tool to use for themselves? Oh yeah, so this one um, is actually on the University of Wyoming's extension page um, under their ranch tools. Um, I use it fairly often. There's, there's other ones out there. Iowa State has one um, or they're relatively simple to put together as well. Um, And so if there's no more questions, um, thanks everyone again for joining. And we hope that you'll be able to join us again on Thursday, same time. Um, Dr. Froelich will be giving a talk on fecal egg counts and um, deworming strategies. So thank you all for joining. Thank you.